Thank you. Yay! <laughs> okay, I'm gonna continue this like the standard um, toxic test format where it's super casual. So don't think I'm a speaker, I'm just uh, someone sharing whatever I know. All right, um, I'm here to share with you um, about building scalable components. Initially, when I started with CSS, right, I didn't really care about code quality. So the quality of my code was like shit at the start. And I thought CSS was really easy. No, no problems. All I had to do was just hack up a design and everything was fine. But then somehow along the way, as I got better as a front-end developer, I started to care about code quality. And that's when I started to feel that CSS is way, 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 way hard. So I started asking myself questions like, how do I make CSS clean, scalable, and maintainable? And that is probably what a lot of you have asked as well, right? Um, with these questions, I have no one to ask, so I went on Google, uh, which is my teacher for almost everything I try to figure out. And the good news with Google is it gives you information. The bad news is it tells you too many things that you might not need to know. So when I search on Google, people say I should use frameworks like Bootstrap and Foundation. Anybody still using Bootstrap and Foundation? Yes, nobody is using it in talks to CSS. That is good, so I'm not going to talk about it. But anyway. Methods like OCSS, um, SMACS, Atomic Design, anyone? No, nobody, no? <laughs> okay. Okay, so what I did was, um, I didn't know what to use, and I basically took everything and tried everything in my, web, in my designs. And I wondered if, um, but even though I tried every single thing I did, right, I didn't really know uh, what was missing. It always felt like something was missing no matter what I tried. Uh, I only got to understand what was the missing factor in my CSS and how to make it um, scalable after I started diving into more into design and CSS at the same time. Design, typography, and CSS. Those, are, those cannot be separated from one another. So I got some thoughts I would like to share with you today. But before that, let me tell you a bit more about myself because Apparently, um, according to Hui Qing, I'm a mysterious recluse and I don't show my face often. So I'm Zell. Here's a picture of me in the middle of the desert, wearing a scarf, trying to like cool. But when I'm not designing, I teach front-end development through my blog. It's on zellwk.com. Um, you can have a look if you'd like to. Uh, the, a course that I wrote that is quite related to what we are talking about today is this thing called res Mastering Responsive Typography. It's been out for about a year or so, I think. And the latest one that I did was learn JavaScript that Chris was talking about earlier. Yeah. So back to, back to the topic. How do you write clean, maintainable, and scalable CSS, right? Um, I'd like to show it to you through my blog. If you resize my blog a little bit here and there, you'll, you'll come to this point where uh, a break point where the font size changed. And then everything along, around, Everything, with the, uh, everything changes according to the font size that changed. So the change is proportional. Uh, we're going to call it proportional scaling for now. We're going to come back to it later and see how to build something that scales proportionally. But let's go a little bit further and see what else needs to happen. If you resize it a little bit more, you'll come to this break point where everything changed. So what changes is the layout changed the font size changed, the proportion between the header font sizes and the body font sizes also changed. So quite a number of things can change at the same time, and it happens on a, a, on a responsive breakpoint. So I'm going to call it responsive scaling, um, and we'll come back to it later. If you poke around the site a little bit further, you'll come to like, see things that are used everywhere. So in this example, you can see that there's a green button over here. This green button is used in another place almost exactly the same, but in a form. Then, but sometimes, um, this green button is used in a different place, but in a different way. So the green button became a pink button if you go onto the mobile and check out the menu button right at the top. But this pink button is at a different size compared to the green button. The padding is different, and the color is different. So how do you create something like that? Um, create something that you can put together in different components, and then use the bigger components or even the smaller components elsewhere to create more composite components. 
So the idea is to do something like that. Um, let's call it modular scaling. All right. <coughs> Just a quick summary. What we are going to talk about today is proportional scaling, responsive scaling, and modular scaling. Proportional scaling, right? <coughs> yeah. Thank you. So components can scale according to a few things. They can scale according to the font size, and they can scale according to the viewport. Those are the two things that components can scale to. If a component scale according to the font size, you want to use relative units like EM, CH, and percentages. Here's one example of how you would use it, right? Um, you have a button with a, with a specific font size, and then you set padding and EM. Once you have set the padding and EM, you can scale the font size infinitely, and you can get a variety of number of buttons of different sizes. These buttons look fine. It, it works. But usually, we don't have so many buttons on our sites. We usually only have three, or maybe less. If you, use, if you do only have three buttons, what you do is you collect the styles that are used um, in all the different sizes, put it into a base class, say, button. And then you can create modifier classes to create your other button sizes just by adding a class to the HTML. So in this case, um, button small and button big. We just change the font size, and you can use it like that in the HTML. It works. Bear in mind that this, this method is just one way of doing something similar to this. You can also use SAS, and then you can use SAS mixins instead of using a base class. If you do that, you only have to write one class in the HTML. So your knowledge may differ. I prefer using the SAS method. Some people will prefer using the CSS method. Both are fine. As the, the, the idea is to use relative units to scale if you need to. So we talk about components that scale according to the font size. Components can also scale according to the viewport. Right? If, you, if your components scale according to the viewport, you would want to use viewport units like VW, VH, Vmin, and Vmax. So here's an example of a square that is always a quarter of the viewport. You can use um, VW, which is 50% of the viewport, and VH, which is 50% of the uh, viewport height. And once you do that, you can create a rectangle that is always 50% of the viewport, no matter how you resize your computer. This can be very useful um, if you want to create things that are responsive to the viewport itself. Like, for example, one application of it is um, fluid typography where you change the typography depending on the viewport. For example, if, and when I resize, the sizes of the typography has changed. But in this case, there isn't a media query at all, because the size depends on the viewport as well. Uh, the implementation looks something like this, where you write font size with a count property and a pixel value or EM value plus a viewport value. Uh, this is an, you, you can read more about this in this article called Fluid Typography by Mike, Mike Riefmiller. Uh, it is an interesting read that you can look into. We are not going to go in, exactly into fluid typography today. The main idea here is to learn, is to know how to scale uh, properties according to what you want it to scale to. So just to end off the proportional scaling part, you want to think about what your, your, what your components scale to. Does it scale according to its own font size? Does it scale according to the font size of the HTML element, like in the example that I showed? If it scales according to the font size, you want to use relative units, like EM, CH, and percentages. Or you can even use the RAM unit if you like to. If it scales according to the viewport, you want to use viewport units. As much as possible, try to refrain from using pixels for creating your components. Because pixels don't scale. Pixels are absolute values. All right. Now, once you have built a few components, you'll want to combine them, kind of like Lego blocks, put one thing into another part, and create a component. This is what we try to do as much as possible in 
web development today. So let's go on to this part where we put together things like Lego blocks. And this is what I call the first part of modular scaling because, well, you're trying to put things in bigger parts. When we think about Lego blocks, the good thing about Lego blocks is that they are, they are very visible. You can take a block, you can stack on top of one another, and you can see the blocks stack on them, uh, stack. But when it comes to the web, we have this kind of weird thing called white space, where when you stack blocks together, you don't really know whether they are stacking or not. But essentially, they can stack together, but because of the white space given by the margin property, they don't. Right? But when we want to think about stacking blocks together, we cannot have extra white space um, hindering our components. If you think about it, can you have a Lego block that is like this, and then suddenly you want to add something on top of it, but you want it them to join together. But then there's this weird thing that you have to reset before they come back together. So this is like the, the weird part of like design. If we start building uh, things with margins outside and creating a lot of white space. So as much as possible, we don't want to have this external white space. Um, oh, here's an example, classic example. If you take a look at this example, this component, you'll see that um, the top and the bottom part is different. The white space is different. And this white space is brought to you by the extra margin bottom from the, par from the paragraph element, which is a default behavior. All right? If you want to remove the paragraph element, uh, the margin bottom on the paragraph element, that's fine. You just remove it with p last child margin bottom. But you may have many properties that have, the, that, that, that have a margin bottom as well, by default. And you just have to reset all of them. And we start going down a losing battle in that case. What I suggest is to reset all the margins and all the paddings right from the start. So you don't have to worry about weird margins and weird paddings coming into your design. If you reset everything, your components stack together naturally. And what you need to do is to add white space whenever you need to. So when you build components together, you don't really want them to stack together always. Sometimes you want them to have white space in between, especially if you have a form, you have um, multiple inputs, you want some white space between the inputs. But the white space is usually managed by the larger component because each of your individual inputs should not have external white space or they will mess around with um, components. So what you do is to put it in, make the larger component handle the white space. To do that, um, you can use this thing called adjacent sibling selectors, which is really, really, really cool. So if you take a look at this example, this is what we usually have, like, what we usually do. Like, um, we set component and then margin bottom to create a white space. And what we do is to remove the last white space by setting margin bottom to zero, like we saw earlier. But if you add, use the adjacent sibling selector, which is the plus over here, you can see that, hey, actually, it, the moment you add adjacent sibling selector, which selects subsequent sibling elements, only the second, third, and fourth things are selected. So the first item isn't selected anymore. And then we can remove the margin bottom and add margin top. Margin, margin top. Then you get the white space as you need it. So the adjacent sibling selector is, is very useful. Um, Hayden Pickering wrote an article called Lobotomized Owl where he talks about a very general adjacent sibling selector with universal selectors, the star. So this, this um, star plus star is what Hayden calls it, the lobotomized hour selector. I tend to use a more localized version component, the direct sibling service component with a star plus star. So this allows me to control the white space directly within a component and nowhere else. Play around with it, um, this is very useful. Now, when we talk about managing internal white space, we also want to think about how your white space scales. For example, let's say we have a button that has a margin top and bottom of 1 EM right now. The problem with doing something like that is when you create a bigger button, the white space becomes inconsistent. Right? When we think about design, we need consistent C. We need, we need the white space to be consistent so our so, um, so the rhythm flows properly, so we read properly, 
and we don't get distracted by anything that feels out of place. That white space makes it feel out of place. If you want to fix this in CSS and you use EM to create your margins, you have to recalculate your margins such that they are now the correct um, EM value. I'm not going to go into the calculation. I think most of you know what is EM, right? Yes? OK. Um, instead of using EM, what happens, what I usually recommend is to use RAM for white spaces. When you use RAM for white space, um, RAM is a unit called root EM. It is tied to the HTML font size value. So when you use RAM for white spaces, all the white space would always be consistent, no matter how, what's the font size of your component. So in this case, even though the button is, has a font size of 2 EM, the white space will always correspond to 1 EM. It doesn't matter what, what numbers you use in there anymore. Now, when you use, just, to, just to prove the point, when you use RAM, look at the button white space that is there. Even though I increase the font size of the button element, the white space remains the same. When we think about building components, we want that white space to remain the same as much as we can. An uh, easy way to think about EM and RAM is EM is kind of like a local variable. Um, like if, if you think about JavaScript or if you go a, a little deeper into programming, EM is like a local variable and RAM is like a global variable. But most programmers think that um, local variables are always good and local, global variables are always bad. That may be true when it comes to programming, but it is not always true when it comes to design. Because in design, we want things to be consistent. So think about this question and, and think whether you want to use EM and RAM together or you want to make life hard for yourself and use EM all the way. So it's up to you. So just to summarize, for LEGO blocks, you want to remove external white spaces from components so they don't interact with the stacking um, for between LEGO blocks. You want to allow your components to manage any internal white space, which allows you to create the components and then reuse them without worrying about how other components hinder with the white space. Finally, you want to prevent the white space from scaling so it doesn't look weird when you increase the font size of a, spe of a specific component. Let's move on to responsive scaling. Once again, responsive scaling happens when you go to a specific breakpoint and then things change. When we think about responsive scaling, the, the main thing that we want to think about is media queries. When we think about media queries, what we focus on usually is min width and max width media queries. All right? Let's say, for example, um, let's go back for a moment. How many people over here use, predominantly use min width media queries? Can I have a show of hands? Min width, min width. How many people use max width media queries predominantly? The rest, the, you, don't use, you, you don't write responsive websites. You, you create static websites. OK, anyway. <clears throat> Let's say, for example, if you have a component where it's, you, want it, you want the font size to be 1 EM, and at a certain breakpoint, you want to increase the, the font size of the component to 2 EM. If you write your components in, media, uh, in, in min width media queries, what you need to do is to set the min width query and add the font size of 2 EM. We don't have to write the font size of 1 EM because font size of 1 EM is already the default. So when you use Minimum linear queries, you can use a lot of the default settings because we want to build mobile first. And when you build mobile first, a lot of it is the defaults. If you go the other way around, you can set 2 EM first, and then you need a max width media query. And now you need to reset the font size back to 1 EM, which is one extra line of code. And if you do grids and all the fancy stuff, you need more lines of code, which makes your code complex. So as much as possible, uh, I would like to suggest that you write min width media queries, uh, favor min width media queries over max width media queries. But that doesn't mean you shouldn't use max width media queries. Let me just go through a very quick example um, to show you why, why. Let's say you want to build a nice square grid 
and set all the colors to blue on a small viewport. Then on the medium viewport, you want the colors to be blue, red, blue, red, so alternate red and blue. On the large viewport, you want everything to be blue on the left three squares. The second, fifth, eight will be red. The third, six, nine squares will be green. So let's say we do this example. Um, I, have a qu I have a quick demo over here. So what happens is, because if you want to write in, um, if, you, if you want all squares to be blue, you can set background color to be blue for all the items on the mobile, just like that. Not too much of a problem. If you want alternate squares to be red, you can set it to Ns child even. Um, you need a little bit of an child full, but that basically says the second, fourth, sixth, eighth, sense, every even item will be red. And you get this immediately. So what, what happens next would tri trip up a lot of people. So if we go about the same line of thinking, if you want the second, fifth, and eighth item to be red, you will set an n child of 3n plus 2. So every third item plus the second item, so second, fifth, eighth, and so on and so forth, to be red. The last three items will be 3n plus 3 or 3n. It's up to you which one you want to choose to be a background color of green. And when you do that, you see that, hey, actually, the fourth square is still red. Why is that so? This is so because the styles from the middle viewport actually bled into the styles on the large viewport. If you don't want the styles to bleed, we can use max width media queries, just like this. We can use max width media queries to constrain those styles so they don't bleed out. And once we do that, the, it's much cleaner. And you don't have to overwrite the styles back to blue again. So or any overriding hints at a code smell. Right, so this is how you can use min with and max with media queries together. And my slides got reset. Where am I? All right. So to summarize for responsive scaling, you want to think about media queries. And when you think about media queries, it's only it's usually about min width and max width media queries. We're not talking about height, but it's the same, um, it's the same thing. You want to favor min width over max width as much as possible, but don't be afraid to use max width to constrain styles to prevent bleed. All right? Now, finally, I want to talk about modular scaling, where we talk about uh, what I call morphable components. So if you think, take a look at this green button and this pink button, they look pretty much the same, right? It's easy to style them. But what you can do is to switch a single class over and it morphs from the green button to the pink button, something similar to that, which is why I call it morphable components. I have a very good example. Um, called found, it's, I found it on Founders Mantra when I tried to teach a student how to code CSS. If you take a look at this, page over here, look at the grid view and the single view. They look almost exactly the same, right? The grid view and the single view. They look almost exactly the same. Both of them have a quote. Both of them have a author view. But the grid view has a, a, has a date view that the single view doesn't. We can combine those two parts into a single component itself. So we don't have to put, we don't have to split this two into two different components. We can put them into one component and create a morph between the two of them. So how to do it? You write your best fit HTML given the different components that you need to create. Then depending on your HTML, how you like to do it, one way is to say single view and grid view as a parent element. Uh, then so do the quote. If you do that, um, then the CSS will be more like dot single view dot quote, for example. Another way to do it is to use modifiers. Most of you probably know about BAM. Um, there'll be quote double, double, double dash single, quote double dash grid. So that would also allow you to style quote and uh, single and grid views differently. So let me just show you a quick demo um, on Founders Mantra. This is something that I built up quickly. Um, what you can do is, you, you can switch it, switch between the, the grid and single view easily by just changing a, a class. That's what the JavaScript does. If I 
open up the HTML, you can look at it and see. So right now, it's, a, it's the single view. We can change it to grid by saying grid. And we can change it back by stating it to single. If you build your components with this in mind, you don't have to split up your components into too many places. And you can consolidate your components with different modifiers at one place. So it doesn't, it doesn't go too much of a, it, it, there's not too much of a brain overhead um, when it comes to building. One thing with morphable components is that it's, it might not be obvious at first glance. So one example is this GOG.com website. Can anybody tell me which components can be glued together into one? These three things can be grouped together into one. Most people will say two things only. But why, why all three things? If you think about it, these three things have a lot of things in common. We have the title, we have the image, we have the background, and when you hover on the, the component itself, the background lights up the same way. The tags are present on two components, the platform are present on two components, but what's slightly different is the layout. You can put them into three different modifiers and create three different layouts. And you can, for, for this specific list view layout, you can add a counter to it. For the other one, you can add description and comments. But if you don't need the description and comments, you can just omit them in the HTML for this too. Right? So this is one way you can group together different components without, without, without overcomplicating um, styles. So for morphable blocks, you want to find similarities and differences between different views of your components. Find the best fit HTML, craft a CSS for them, and then modify that CSS with one class if you can. Because the moment you modify one class, you don't have to worry about too many classes changing at the same time. And some additional tips. Naming components, I find using BAM really helpful. So this is a band modifier with a double dash, which we showed earlier. And you have items within a band element. You can use a double underscore um, to signify that this date is part of a quote, for example. Second tip will be namespacing. Once you have a lot of different components together, <laughs> components start to become a mouthful, right? So what I like to do is to split naming into elements and components. What Brett Force does is, atoms, molecules, and organisms is pretty much the same. I just like to keep it to two levels. Then I also have grids for my layout, states, JavaScript with um, JS, then typography, and themes. So this is how I split my namespaces. Finally, you want to manage specificity because IDs, class, and tags, they have, con they have different specificity. You want to start your style sheet with tags as much as possible so you can override them with classes later, on, later down the road. You want to start your components as much as possible with classes and not do IDs because IDs cause a spike and then you have to relook at the whole specificity curve and then just throw away the IDs so you don't have to worry about that. So keep the components, um, keep, uh, keep the classes as much as possible. For more information, I would suggest reading the specificity graph by Harry Roberts. Interesting read, and it will help you manage your CSS a lot better. With that, thank you. Um, I think I rushed a little bit too much, but thank you. Here are the slides, and this is my blog. Yeah. I think I rushed a bit too much. Thank you very much, Sil.